his father, who was a country doctor, and um, his mother had died, and he was being, she was affected with his mother, um, and that's him and his younger sister, and that's his older brother, um, and he's clutching uh, one of the Cape endemic plants, which was a horticultural rarity at the time and his father was very keen on horticulture and for some reason he gave him to hold embracing it um, a plant of a kind that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> turned out to be very important for him um, and this is this is the drawing room this is where you can think of it as the room where Darwin relaxed from his work we're going to the study next but this is their drawing room with the garden just there and, um, now, now, I have seen that photograph. Yes, yes. That's the original sitting right there? No, no, no. The original is upstairs. Oh, okay. yes. The original, is, it's a daguerreotype, so there's only one of course. copy, yes. And it's upstairs, and it's one of the treasures. It's the only picture of Darwin with somebody else. Uh -huh. And it's his son. Um, who, who, his, who played the oboe? The only, his son, Frank. That's a bassoon, sir, I believe. Oh, it's, sorry, of course, yes, it is, yes, it so is, yes. It, it pays to have someone who yeah, is genuinely... Yeah. Kind of That's what they played, he played that to the earthworms, didn't he? Yes, yeah. and he, it's there because, um, right, you know, his last book was on earthworms, and he got fascinated, living with them to see how they work the earth, he got fascinated by their minds mm -hmm. and how um, primitive they were, but yet what? powers they might have and he did these experiments to find out what their senses were and one of them was to see whether they had a sense of hearing and he put them on a table next to the piano and asked Emma his wife to play a few loud chords absolutely no reaction and asked Frank to play the bassoon no reaction and then he put the flower pots on the lid of the piano where they are now and she played a chord and they darted back and he um, reckoned that they had a sense, you know, the feeling but not hearing. Mm -hmm. um, and she was a very good pianist and played to sort of help him calm down mm -hmm. um, from his mental efforts and he would sit on the chaise longue and she would play and they also played backgammon. And their actual backgammon set was the little box, right the way his ideas were taken by others. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah. And he understood how important faith was for her. Oh, nine. And then it was, um, they change any of the, didn't change any of the layout of the garden or the grounds. Um, and then, it's when it when's two sons, two surviving sons, and that's it. Servants and the adults, and they would all gather there, mm -hmm. and the, the, the little children would change costumes and come out of this little door with their, um, you know, with their fairy wands and whatever it was that they were acting. Um, but before that. Um, Frank, the, the, the bassoonist, uh -huh. had found in here the sketch, the first sketch of the, um, the theory, oh. uh, the 1842 sketch, mm -hmm. the 1842 sketch. sketch, the 1844 essay, yep. natural selection, and then the origin of the four stages, and the 1842 sketch is, I think, just breathtaking. Mm -hmm. it's, it's scribble, it's, a, it's uh -huh. a scribble, it's sort of in note form. And, but he gets right the way around the course. Um, and uh, it was there in a pile of paper that one side of which had been used for the children to take if they wanted to go on the other side. So that is, that's the actual chair. That is the board that he wrote on. He didn't write at a desk. He wrote with the board on his lap. The 
this is the table that he had for papers and everything. That is his microscope. It's a single microscope because he wasn't working at high um, his magnification. And he liked to be, I mean, he was often dissecting, dissecting particles. Um, yeah, there's a marvelous scene in the movie. Creation, yes, yes. Where yes, he's yes. got he's got his yes, children exactly. over his yes, barnacles on yes, the yes. Just great. Yes. Yes. But that was um they bought um they got a single microscope, mm -hmm. a good one, uh, for that. His dissecting instruments. And that one actually was that model was marketed um, by the manufacturers because by then Darwin had a reputation mm -hmm. in his work on barnacles. And it was modeled, it was marketed as Darwin's dissecting microscope. Ah. So Mr. Darwin is known um, for that kind of work. It's clearly his choice. Those are the three um, faces that he wanted to have looking over him as he worked. Lyle, because he was his, just his inspiration, and Darwin was just carrying forward Lyellian uh, some principles and methods in the life sciences. Um, Joseph Hooker, because he was his closest and best um, sort of signing board and advisor. Indeed. Yeah, yeah, for and then just on a way to because he, I think Darwin <laughs> learned about experiment from Josiah. Really? Yes. Oh. Yeah. Um, this study, before, while well, Darwin was still working here, before he left, they took one photograph just to record mm -hmm. how it was. And each of those shelves had a little paper label um, on it to, to, to the side. And um, people who um, are familiar with Darwin's notes and papers from the 1850s onwards um, group the notes in Darwin's system of grouping. And his system of grouping was basically those shelves stacked up from the bottom to the top. And each of them was a chapter of the origin. Mm. And so if you get chur four or chur six, chur four. You, you speak for the. Uh, I speak from. I speak from. Billiards or snooker? Uh, uh, billiards. Uh, 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 yes. Uh, yes. A wasted youth. Uh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Well, it's. I uh, just. Uh, Peter Sellers film in which he manages to tear the green velvet. Um, favorite portrait of Darwin, and Mark would have heard me um, saying this before. And it's, he's kept it all to himself. Um, and it's sort of 54, 55, 56 when he starts um, explaining to people and just trying them out and so on. But and he's, he's had so much to think about in his science and his the rest of his life. Um, but this is before and it shows him uh, the, the same thing that I he, found in my book is just how much how reflective he was. He looks formidable. Yes. I mean, yes. Yes. So this is the one by Julia Margaret Cameron, mm -hmm. um, and the point about it, people like the inscription, which says, "I like this photograph very much better than any other that's ever been taken of me." It's, I think, a very dull photograph. I see very little love of hair and not much else. And um, the point about that inscription, which was reckoned to be a wonderful, you know, sort of unsolicited testimonial, is that then when you look at her portraits of other notabilities in Victorian England, you find exactly the same wording over their signature. <laughs> Special because it's the the only picture of Darwin smiling. He's normally very withdrawn, very shy, and it's quite clear from um, letters, diaries, and reminiscences that he was very shy in company. But when he was with people that he knew well and whose sense of humour he enjoyed, he just loved a laugh and a joke, and was. Impish in his own humour, and um, you know, just was delighted in a conversation that had sort of twists and turns mm -hmm. and laughs. And what this is very strange because what on earth is he sitting on? 
And the answer is that he's, we know that this was sketched one day by a request of Vanity Fair, the editor wrote saying we want to include you in our series. Um, could could um, someone come around and sketch you for the caricature? And the person must have come round to his brother's house in Mayfair in London, and must they must have, he must have gone into the room to be sketched, mm -hmm. and they must Darwin was very tall and had these long legs, and he always had to fold them up before he could sit down comfortably. And you'll see the chair next door is raised up on wheels so that he can fold his legs. Um, and I guess that in that room, there was no chair that he could sit comfortably on without <laughs> raising himself quite considerably because he's way above the armrests. Yes, and he. And what I hadn't appreciated at that time is, is how how many people were interested in this particular question? We, we held yeah. a debate at my university in the spring of 1981. Yeah. And three... 81? Three yes. thousand yes. people came to it. Yeah. You know, if, if I talked about my work, I could get 20. Yeah. Um, but th three thousand people. And Where did you accommodate three thousand people? In the ice hockey rink. Really? That <laughs> is the largest amazing. room on campus, that's right. I mean, I can tell you the story yeah. of the debate, which uh -huh. was... And at that point, I realized... Yeah. Well, what I had started in preparation for this to read the books and pamphlets and so forth of the so-called scientific creationists and just yes. got angrier and angrier and angrier yes. Yes. <laughs> as a scientist about, yes. you know, the distortions, the half-truths, yes. and the complete falsehoods yes. that yes. They, were, they were putting together. Point about the house was This way, you can really see what it was that he was getting. When he stood by the column, sure, he was there. against one of those columns, and that's Virginia Creeper. Um, and he would you know, spend a great deal of his time just sitting in one of those wicker chairs, looking out, or looking out into the garden. The kitchen garden is just over there, we'll come and go along there soon. And he would have things going on in every different part of the gods, um, a replication of the experiment that he described in a paragraph in the chapter on natural selection in The Origin of Species, um, in which he took just a small patch of um, habitat, grass, and um, you know, the number of mm -hmm. seedlings that only one in seven survive. Right. This is just the same way. He's trying. He's finding a way of um, showing a process that is normally beyond our powers to recognise because of just the time it takes. It's a very gradual process, and this has to do with the earthworms working the soil and gradually lowering in heavy objects in it. And uh, the trick of it is that these two rods are bedded in the chalk, which is about 15 feet below, and then there's the soil. And this is a millstone, which um, he's just put this little collar in, and there's a measuring device, which we can see upstairs in the house, which he brought out um, three or four times a year, and just put over into these, um, grooves like that and then screwed the little sort of measuring screw up so he could measure within fractions of a millimeter and detect movement and he found over the years that it had quite a considerable movement huh. up and down just with temperature mm -hmm. and humidity but if you his son carried on the experiment and by the 1890s they were able to show that if you took the average of the fluctuations, there was a clear downward trend from their own cultivation. Um, there wasn't a green greengrocer. Um, and so it was mostly Emma's territory. And Darwin was just allowed this little area in front of the greenhouses where he worked. And these were his experimental beds, so-called. And so this was 
um, here and here was really the closest he came to having a laboratory. Uh, and here is an observatory hive. And the point here is that this is all about intelligent design. Um, do you remember the uh, passage in um, <coughs> The Origin? I think it's in the Chaffron Instinct, in which he um, finds a natural explanation for the perfection of the hexagonal cells in okay, yeah, Honeybee's yes, code. Yes, yes, yes. And um, again, I mean, he, it was, you know, the eye was one challenge, mm -hmm. and the other one that he knew would be thrown at him was the, uh, the, the B's hexagonal cone, mm -hmm. utter, mm -hmm. regular, utterly regular, built in the, you know, the dark confines, mm -hmm. the crowd and everything like that. Mm -hmm. And he um, worked out a way of detecting how they formed the cells that enabled him to argue how the hexagons might have formed naturally. Mm -hmm. It is, and it's longer and dark, and other bees tend to be sort of gathering around it. Cerro mm. rotundifolia, um, eating insects, um, and he did wonderful series of experiments on how they capture the insects and how they digest them and how they don't bother to digest and release things that aren't going to be digestible. Um, and people had no idea that this had anything to do with nutrition ah. before. And um, he eventually did an experiment. He showed them catching um, and then there should be, there should be, you should, you should feel someone over here. No, 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 it's, it's, it's these ones. Um, and this is taken, I think, against that door there. Um, and the famous orchid, Angricrum sesquipedale, the one in Madagascar, um, he has growing, we have, they have growing here, yeah. and flowers in February. It's one of these ones up here. It's the comet orchid. Is that what this is? This no, no, this is a pitcher plant. That's what it's like. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Um, his intense interest in variation under domestication, he was particularly interested in gooseberries um, and had 54 different varieties of gooseberry growing in this one garden. Um, they're now. Um, badly affected by disease, and they obviously can't use herbicides Ooh. in this garden, which so they don't actually look very good. I think uh, they must they must have grown it in Darwin's time. I think uh -huh. they probably did. This would have been a real you know Victorian yeah. type of. Uh, it's just to push the button and uh, oh, I, I, said, focus. I forgot there's such a thing called an optical sight. Yes, yes, it's halfway to focus. <laughs> uh, it's, I'm going to take a picture, but it's not focusing. Um, with its vegetable garden and its field, it only Darwin was never a squire. It's often suggested that he was a country, you know, became a country squire and so on. He never was. He was a Victorian gentleman living in a country villa that needed its vegetable garden and its home meadow for the cattle and the horses that for the carriages. Mm -hmm. um, and this was the size of meadow that you needed for a house and a household of this mm -hmm. kind. Owen's field, so he could use it intensively for experimentation. Mm -hmm. Lots of work on soil structure. Um, Five years in London, just thinking everything through, working out the hypothesis, and then 40 years here, 
working it all out. There's a scene in creation when Huxley and Hooker are walking with Darwin along a path and Huxley is urging him to publish Wait. and Darwin's saying not yet and the three of them were walking along this path and the cameramen were running behind with their cameras and the, you know, the man was up to the microphone and they had the light and all the film crew were just behind there and I, I was um, in the audience and it was just so ridiculous and he would just put one of them in like that and there's a, um, a joke told by every guy and his children who liked to be with him when he was when he was walking around um, they would they wanted him to stay longer while he was on one of them would come along and just put one of the stones back <laughs> in position and he, uh, oh, he said that not Elso Barkman no no I'm thinking old guys are um, still alive huh? well he, he wasn't at the time so yeah. he published the last book in around 99 and 